Okay. Uh, the Rambam's Mishnah Torah. So there are ten laws or halakot here. We're going to get as far as we can today. We're going to read the text, go through the notes, and uh, try to answer any questions or uh, d any discussion, comments, whatever the case. Uh, Baruch Hashem, may He bless us with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. So the essence, this Halakha 1 of chapter 2, the essence of the commandment forbidding the worship of false gods is not to serve any of the creations, not an angel, a sphere, or a star, none of the four fundamental elements, nor any entity created from them, even if the person wor worshiping knows that Hashem is the true God and serves the creation in the manner in which Enosh and the people of his generation worshiped the stars originally, he is considered to be an idol worshiper. That's a pretty big opening statement for chapter 2. Um, okay, let's, let's look at this a little bit. It's talking about creations, any creations, not to worship or serve them, no false gods, no, can't worship or serve angels, spheres, uh, spheres would be like planets and the luminaries, the moon, the sun, so on and so forth, um, or a star, well, maybe the sun's not a sphere, it'd be more like a star, but anyway, <laughs> um, he clarifies here to say none of the four fundamental elements. Okay, anybody know what those are? Fire, and earth. Air, fire, water, and earth. Very good. Um, anybody seen the movie The Fifth Element? <laughs> There's no fifth element according to this. No, <laughs> right. This is four. <laughs> but nonetheless, we don't worship those things or anything created from those things. Which basically is saying here that... Um, they, that's the four fundamental elements of creation, um, which turns in, which translates to the four levels of created things, which would be um, elemental, such as uh, salt. An element could be like salt or hydrochloric acid. Uh, any, anybody here been a chemistry student? I'm sure with the periodic table. How many? Anybody know how many elements are in a periodic table? Over 200? So basically, all, uh, the, that's the foundation of creation, is the periodic, the elements in the periodic table. Uh, there may be more elements there that we don't know about, so we'll just, w w we can be safe to say that we know about these elements on the periodic table, but there's probably, there might be more, with all due respect. Um, then secondarily, you have plant life. Uh, then the third level would be animal life and then humanity, the four levels of created beings. Kind of parallels, right, with the four fundamental elements, earth, wind, fire, water. And there's, there's probably an order to that that I'm messing up, but we get the idea. So basically, even if the person worshiping knows that Hashem is the true God and serves the creation in the manner in which Enosh and the people of his generation worshiped the stars originally, he is considered to be an idol worshiper. Just to recap for a second, Enosh was the grandson of Adam. We went over this two classes ago, but just to recap a little. The grandson of Adam, Enosh, the Torah says that in his day, people began to profane the name of God, the name of Hashem. Often translations will say that people began to call upon the name of God and during the time of Enosh. The Hebrew text is in indicative of that they began to call upon his name in a profane manner. The explanation of this from the sages is that the, the, the wise men of the generation of Enosh, that they erred by viewing the stars and the constellations and the planets, you know, the luminaries, as mediators, between them and God. So they inappropriately began to uh, create a form of worship towards these entities that distracted them from the true worship of the one true God. Thank you, uh, Leslie, for that. It's 118 elements on the periodic table. 
That's pretty close to 200. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, basically, that's why why the Rambam is uh, revisiting this thing about Enosh. So, even though the people of Enosh were worshiping these stars as a mediate mediatorial role uh, to honor Hashem, it was still considered idolatry. So. Again, two classes ago, we brought up this idea. The Rambam brought out this thought process called Shituf. Shituf is where you have people that, uh, that worship a mediator in order to connect to God. What the Rambam is saying here, that this is considered idolatry. Okay? Simply because this, the worship of uh, a mediator here indicates that a person is taking something created and placing it between themselves and God as a, medi a mediator that, does not de that doesn't deserve worship. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so the primary objective here is to recognize that placing any type of created thing between us and God as a form of worship detracts from our, our true worship of God, it's considered idolatry. So the goal here is to worship the one true God with all purity, righteousness, and holiness, with no obstacles. So worship the creator, not the yes. Worship the Creator, not the creation. Okay, the Torah warns us about this saying in Deuteronomy 4.19, lest you lift your eyes heavenward and see the sun, the moon, and the stars, and bow down and worship them, the entities which God apportioned to all the nations. This implies that you might inquire with the eye of the heart, and it might appear to you that these entities control the world. Having been apportioned by God to all the nations to be alive, to exist, and not to cease existence, as is the pattern of the other creations with the world. Therefore, you might say that it is worthy to bow down to them and worship them. So the way of the world, all created beings in the world, is to live for a time and then uh, pass away, die. Okay? Um, all living creatures, even plant life, dies. Is that correct? So what he's saying here, basically, is we may have a tendency to look up at these things that don't die, and uh, because they don't change and they don't move and they, they stay in their pattern throughout eternity, that we might inappropriately view them as living creatures and begin to worship them as eternal beings. This is, th this is problematic. So... For this reason, Deuteronomy 11.16 commands, Be very careful that your heart not be tempted to go astray and worship other gods. This implies that the thoughts of your heart should not lead you astray to worship these and make them an intermediary between you and the Creator. Okay, now we'll go into the notes here, the commentary on Halakha 1. Okay, the essence of the commandment forbidding the worship of false gods is not to serve any of the creations. So the Rambam counts the prohibition against worshiping false gods as the first of the 365 negative commandments. Now, if you guys remember uh, a while back, uh, it, it was kind of a long while back, we went through the, the positive and negative commandments. There are 248 positive commandments which are represented by the 248 members of the human body, which is indicative of doing all of the positive things of the Torah with all of your being. Then here we have the 365 commandments mentioned. They correlate with the 365 days of the solar year, uh, which means basically every day of your life you don't do these things. So the negatives are don't do's, the positives are what we do. We do the positives with all of our being. We, we don't do the negatives every day of our life. It's a beautiful concept. So in these Holocaust, he does not mention this prohibition in the manner in which he usually introduces one of the 613 mitzvot in this text. 
because he introduced this prohibition previously in the Mishnah Torah, mentioning it in Hilkot Yesodei HaTorah 1.6, which is a previous chapter in Mishnah Torah. The inclusion of this mitzvah in those Holocaust is appropriate because it is one of the foundations of our faith. So, it's foundational in the Jewish faith, in the, in the Torah observant world, it's foundational not to worship idols. This is on the top of the list. This is number one of the negative commandments. Do not worship idols. So again, the primary idea that we're talking about today and uh, in this series of teachings from the Rambam and Avadat Kokavim is what is idol worship and am I doing it? You see, that should be our goal. What is idol worship? Am I doing it? If we are doing it, <clears throat> if, we are, if we find ourselves doing it, it's not that big of a deal. It's, it's simple. We just stop. <laughs> stop doing it. It can be scary. Oh, no, I found out I, I'm, I, I do idol worship. That can be kind of scary. But it's, if you didn't know before and you know now, what do you do now that you know? You just stop. Yes, I don't mean to make light of it, you know, it could be scary, but at the same time, if we just stop and say, okay, I was doing this, I didn't know, now I can stop because I know. All right, he says, not an angel, a sphere, or a star. So you can see uh, in the chapter known as Hilkot Yesaday HaTorah, chapters 2 and 3 for a description of these creations. So the Rambam even goes into great detail of what these things are. Okay, none of the four fundamental elements. We listed them earlier, fire, wind, water, and earth. The Rambam describes the existence and function of these four fundamental elements in Hilkot Yesodei HaTorah, chapters 3 and 4. So, anybody that wants to go on Chabad.org uh, it, it's a free service. You can go anytime online to Chabad.org. Uh, look up Rambam's Mishnah Torah. You can find the text right there, Yesodei HaTorah, and it explains uh, the angels, spheres, stars, the four fundamental elements and created things in the physical world in great detail. It's beautiful. Okay, nor any entity created from them all the creations of our physical world are created from a combination of these four elements. So everything is a result of fire, wind, water, and earth. One or the other or all. It just depends on what, what we're talking about. So even if the person worshiping knows that Hashem is the true God and serves the creation in the manner in which Enosh and the people of his generation Worship the stars originally. Uh, we did cover this already. Uh, it refers back to chapter 1, Halakha 1, which, again, if, you, if you're just coming into this class and you want to learn a little more about it, again, you can check it out on Chabad in the text, or you can go back to our first class, which was two weeks ago. You can find that on Nativ.net or on YouTube. Just look up Rambam's Mishnah Torah, and it'll pop up for you. You'll see my pretty face on the screen. <laughs> okay, the Torah warns us about this saying in Deuteronomy 4.19, lest you lift your eyes heavenward and see the sun, the moon, and the stars and bow down and worship them, the entities which God apportioned to all the nations. As mentioned in the previous chapter, there are some authorities who are using this verse as proof text, do not prohibit Gentiles from worshiping false gods with this intent. However, all authorities agree that Jews may not worship in this manner. Again, that's that concept of shituf. Okay. Um, there's a lot of information out there in the Talmud Bavli. Um, you can look into it, uh, the word shituf. And again, like we talked about two weeks ago, this is something that uh, the Torah doesn't expressly prohibit. So the sages, some of the sages... Uh, would say that it's not strictly prohibited for a person that is a non-Jew that finds himself in this type of worship to be completely 
off the track. Uh, can you write that? Can you find that, April? The problem with it, with spelling it, with spelling Shetuf in the English is that's a transliteration. So it may be different depending on. Well, the, that's what I'm saying. The problem is with the transliteration, sometimes they're different. So you may have to look up different spellings of it to find it because it's a Hebrew word. <clears throat> okay. So um, April's looking it up for us now to see if there's a common transliteration that we can share. It's not a very common idea. So no, this, uh, this is S-H-I-T-U-F. Uh -huh. Okay, it comes up on Wikipedia. Wow, they really do have everything, don't they? You might not want to read what Wikipedia says about it. Yeah. For the worship of God, in a manner which you, you are Judaism does not deem to be monotheistic. Right. So, uh, yeah, the Wikipedia is sometimes a good source. Sometimes it's not, but it will if you find it. If you find, like, excuse me again. <clears throat> um, where I'm going with that is anytime you look at sources like Wikipedia, make sure that they have citations before you take it uh, with full seriousness. If they give citations, you can refer to the citations, then it'll give you more information. It's better to go like on H or something. Right, yeah, of course, uh, you know, we're biased. We're definitely biased concerning our Torah study. We want to go to the, to the Torah sages if we can. Yeah, the idea of is uh, it says the simplest meaning I know is the act of associating the one true God with an idol, believing that this entity works with God somehow in the way he run in the way he runs the universe, and this associate is also a God. God is the main being, but this entity, this partner, this associate is also a God worthy of some form of worship, either in mind or active service. Okay. Very good. Let me, can I read that so that, uh... Where is that from? What is she to? The simplest meaning I know of is the act of associating the one true God with an idol, believing that this entity works with God somehow in the way he runs the universe, and this associate is also a God. God is the main being, but this entity, this partner, this associate, is also a God worthy of some form of worship, either in mind or in active service. Now this, this idea, again, we're not propagating it. The sages don't propagate it. The Torah does not propagate it. On the heaviest level for Jewish people to observe, this Shituf idea is completely forbidden. Again, some of the sages of Israel... The, uh, on a technical level, would say that this may not be forbidden for certain non-Jews to do. The reason they say this is because the sages constantly cover every base concerning the Torah, whether it's legal or not legal, you know, whether it can be done or not done on a technical level, even down to the technicalities of it. It's n there's no leaf unturned. So the idea here is any form of idol worship is not propagated by the Torah, on a technical level, she too may not be specifically forbidden for certain Gentiles. Okay. Um, again, this is a technicality like we brought up two weeks ago concerning kosher. Uh, the, Torah, the Torah specifically gives the laws of kashrut for Jewish people for the nation of Israel. Okay, but is it forbidden for a non-Jew to eat kosher? No, not at all. Is, it, is the non-Jew commanded specifically to keep kosher? No. No. But there are, there are spiritual connotations to eating unclean. Um, you know, the sages, just on a brief, the sages teach that if we eat the flesh of an unclean animal, that it blocks our ability to absorb certain types of holiness and spiritual things. It makes us unclean as well. So what God has deemed unclean, if we participate in it, we're deemed unclean. Right. So 
When God says that idolatry is the worship of a, of a mediator or any created thing, it may not be technically forbidden for a non-Jew to do that because the Torah doesn't specifically say it, but it's definitely not, the Torah is definitely not propagating to do such things. Exactly. Idolatry defiles one. It simply defiles a person in the highest level. This is why idolatry is at the top of the list of all commandments. Let's parallel that for a second. Uh, the ten words, the ten words in uh, what are known as the Ten Commandments. It starts off saying, uh, I am Hashem who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim. There is no other God other than me. Do not worship idols. The Sheva Mitzvot, what's number one? Do not worship idols, there's only one God. It's pretty simple. All of humanity is forbidden from worshiping idols. All of humanity. It is a detriment to our relationship with Hashem. Don't you think that it's important to note that this is a merciful outlook on people? For the sages to write something like that is very compassionate. Yes. A mercy, Jasmine said it's uh, the sages uh, touching on this subject can be a point of view of great mercy, uh, the mercy of Hashem, and uh, how people that don't realize that they are walking in idolatrous ways that really want to know God, you know, eventually they'll come out of it and they'll know God. But uh, God does have compassion. Hashem is a compassionate God. He loves the human race. Stop condemning themselves. Yes. And it's a process. I mean, there's a reason, again, why idolatry is on the top of the list. That is, this is the biggest thing that we find ourselves in, okay? This is why we chose to go into this tractate of Mishnah Torah first. This is the biggest thing here that affects humanity is idolatry, okay? It's important for us to know what it is. Like we said a while ago, we learn these things, we find out that we, we may be practicing idolatry. That's not a good feeling, okay. Understood, let's just stop. Okay, back to the text. This is really good, guys. I really appreciate your input. Okay. Yes, we left off with the idea of Shituf. So this should not be interpreted simply as forbidding us to gaze at the celestial beings. So, um, so this, but rather implies that you might inquire with the eye of the heart and it might appear to you that these entities control the world. So the issue here is not gazing at the stars. I mean, uh, astro the study of astronomy, let me make that clear, astronomy, the study of the luminaries is not forbidden. Okay. It's whenever we, the Rambam says here, whenever we inquire with the eye of the heart, and it might appear to us that these entities control the world. All right. This is, please forgive me for any crassness or offense. This is not intended to be offensive. Okay. But the, the shifting of astronomy into astrology could definitely become a place where we are looking into these things with the eye of the heart in order that they give us controlling, uh, excuse me, these entities, we might view them that they control the world, that everything comes down from the stars in the world and everything in it is controlled by them. That That's... That's like the far negative side of astrology that we don't want to participate in. It's not appropriate to rely on the stars to tell us how to live our lives. Would that be like um, part of what you're saying here? Would that be like uh, looking at the moon and how it controls the tides going in and out and saying, oh, well, the moon is in control rather than saying Hashem is in control of the moon that controls the, the tides. That's a good point there, yes. Uh, the moon isn't in control of anything. It's a created entity just like anything else. You see, 
Now, the, the movements of the moon that, that God put into place may have an effect on the tides and so on, but it's not the power of the moon that does that, if I'm following you. Yeah, solar flares are not going to destroy the entire earth one day because Hashem says they're not, right. basically. The that's not Right, and he, yeah, the sun is not in control. The solar flares are not what is the detriment of mankind. Idolatry is. <laughs> we shouldn't be, a. Uh, don't get me wrong, if, uh, you know, if there's a hurricane coming, let's move. Let's get out of the way if we can, if we can help it. Let's get out of the way. You know, tornadoes coming. Don't stand there and say, well, God, you know, God didn't say I was going to die by a tornado. Well, guess what? If you stand in the highway in front of a bus, you might get hit. <laughs> so let's not stand in the highway. Let's go in the cellar or the basement or the safe place that we can go for a tornado. If we can help ourselves get out of the way of a hurricane, you know, put on sunscreen when you go to the beach. It, okay. But it's not that the sun is going to kill you because you didn't put on sunscreen. It's just the nature of creation that the sun burns your skin with ultraviolet rays. Doesn't mean the sun has power over your body. Hashem does. He's the orchestrator of all created things. They don't have a mind of their own. Just as He made the sun, He gave us wisdom to know how to protect ourselves from the sun. Exactly. Wisdom is called sunscreen or clothes. Uh, maybe even an umbrella. It's up to you. <laughs> Teva. Teva? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that a shoe company? Yeah. Teva? Yeah. yeah. It's a sandal company. <laughs> a drug company too? Awesome. Is the shoe company and the drug company the same thing? <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, I'm in a silly mood today. All right, I'll, I'll knock it off. All right, so these luminaries, they do perform essential functions within the natural order like we just described. So they don't have a mind of their own. They do what God created them to do. Um, luminaries don't have free choice. Just like animals, plants, and uh, earth, wind, water, fire, all, you know, all created things lack the ability of free choice other than human beings. We're the crown of creation when we do what we're created to do. The sages say if we fail to do what we're created to do, we're lower than a gnat. But whenever we get it right, man, we're the best. We're the crown of creation in the, in the eyes of Hashem. So having been apportioned by God to all the nations to be alive. So see Hilkot, Yesodei HaTorah 3, 9, which states that the stars and the spheres are alive and are conscious of God's existence. To exist and not to cease existence as is pattern of the other creations with the world. So in the first chapters of the Guide for the Perplexed, it's another writing by the Rambam, volume 2, and briefly in Hilkot Yesodei HaTorah 4.3, the Rambam explains that all the creations of this world are combinations of different elements and will therefore ultimately return to their initial elemental state. In contrast, the existence of the stars and the spheres remains constant. Therefore, you might say that it is worthy to bow down to them and worship them, to honor those who God honors as mentioned in chapter 1, Halakha 1, or to derive benefit from serving them as mentioned in Halakha 2 of that chapter. For this reason, Deuteronomy 11:16 commands, be very careful. The words be very careful imply a prohibition stemming from the Torah. In Halakha 3, the Rambam describes a prohibition involved, involved in harboring such thoughts. Do you know anything about the sun being alive part? Can you study that? Um, 
not um, not enough to discuss right now. I have I have read some about it. Okay. Okay, that your heart be not tempted to go astray and worship other gods. This implies that the thoughts of your heart should not lead you astray to worship these and make them an intermediary between you and the Creator. <coughs> Excuse me. I had the, had the air conditioner too cold last night, I guess. So note the fifth of the Rambam's 13 principles of faith. Commentary on the Mishnah Sanhedrin, chapter 10. So the fifth fundamental principle is that it is fit to serve God alone and not the entities who are below Him, the angels, the stars, the spheres, or the fundamental elements. This is because they all perform their functions because of their inherent nature. They have no control or choice but merely fulfill God's will. Uh, we should not make them intermediaries to reach Him through them, but rather direct all our thoughts to Him, Hashem, to God, paying no attention to anything else. This is the prohibition against worshiping false gods. So this is what we were talking about a few minutes ago concerning uh, the stars and the spheres and the constellations. Um, they, do, they don't possess the ability to make choices and decide what happens to creation. So this is a false thing to see these entities as such. Uh, it's the same way with angels. Uh, the list here again, the angels, the stars, the spheres, or the fundamental elef ele elephants, elements. <laughs> <laughs> Funda yeah, those two, fundamental elements or elephants. Um, so all of these things are created from elements. Uh, um, a nicely formed set of molecules. Okay. So... Um, all these things are created from the four basic elements, uh, earth, wind, fire, water. They do have a role in creation uh, that has been set forth by God, but they do not decide what happens in creation. They do not possess the ability to make decisions concerning creation. They only do what God created them to do if that makes sense. Therefore, they are not worthy of worship on that note, but on the simplest note, they are not Hashem, so they are not worthy of worship. Okay, well, <clears throat> I think we can stop here for today. Uh, this has been very informative. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Um, now we'll open up for questions and comments, and uh, to all of our viewers online, thank you for joining us. Shalom.